Nava Atlas, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been a long time. It's been years, I think. Yeah. And it's funny, we just, uh, I, don't, I don't think the last time we, I wasn't using video, so I think we probably just talked on the phone. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, Zoom is, who ever heard of Zoom before last March? I know I didn't. Well, you know, I was, uh, I was using it with, um, for, I've been using it, I think, since 2016 for group coaching. And like, it's, it sounds horrible to say, but like one of the upsides of the pandemic was now everyone can get on Zoom. I used to spend like half of my time coaching people with this technology. And now it's amazing how quickly it became ubiquitous. Well, I like it because I can attend events that I wouldn't normally be able to go to, like the um, Bronte Parsonage in Northern England. They have great programs and I'm really obsessed with the Bronte sisters. So it's been such a pleasure. And I really hope that hopefully post pandemic, people will still continue to do hybrid presentations because I think it just broadens the opportunity to learn new things all the time. Yeah, and I was, um, you know, I was going to a local gym, which I, you know, obviously had to stop and they've opened up since, but I have no desire to, to go back yet. And I found an online gym and I thought, how terrible is that going to be? And I found like, imagine, you know, the Zoom and there's like 20 people on the Zoom and the, the two instructors are looking at everybody. And the second your form goes off, they'll tell you. Whereas in a, in a real class, you could spend 15, 20 minutes you know, cranking your back out and no one would notice. Well, I'm sorry to say this, but I have no desire to go back to movie theaters, live theater, yes. Movie theaters, mm. no. Mm. Well, I yeah. think we're, you know, a lot of us are gonna change our habits. Yeah, it's been interesting to see how this, uh, how this sort of digital upload into our DNA changes our lives and our culture. For the good and to the bad. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the good. Um, you got a beautiful new book out. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, it's called Plant Powered Protein. And so what, what made you want to write it? Well, I remember distinctly what made me want to write it because I always called myself a soup and salad vegan. I wasn't, I didn't really gravitate that much to the alternative proteins, you know, the meat like alternative proteins. But at the beginning of 2019, there was just this explosion of interest. And I think that's when Beyond was preparing for their initial public offering. And, you know, you just heard about this in newspapers, magazines, websites, it just seemed to be out there. <clears throat> so I remember distinctively, I was reading an article in, in the New York Times about Bruce Friedrich, who mm -hmm. used to be part of PETA. <clears throat> Famously, he would throw red paint at models who were wearing furs. And he came to the realization that what he was doing wasn't working. So his objective was to get people to feel bad about exploiting animals and to stop eating meat. But he, that kind of in your face approach just wasn't reaching his objective. So instead he founded the Good Food Institute, which, folk, uh, which still is very active. In fact, I'm giving a, a Zoom talk to them on Wednesday to their employees which focuses on the research and development around these type of plant proteins. And that has been hugely successful and hugely impactful. And so I thought, well, even though maybe it hasn't up until then been my cup of tea, these kind of products are helping people to transition from being omnivores to eating a more plant-based diet. And what I did, what I wanted to make sure to do in my book is to also include tons and tons of vegetables. So it really became kind of a, a transitional book. And I'm not saying that once somebody crosses the bridge, they should never use these products. Some people, I mean, obviously a lot of people really like them. So I'd rather have them consume these products than to use the animal variety. Yeah, I will, I will admit to having two Impossible Burgers in the past month. Uh, what did you think? Because I haven't tried Impossible yet. Beyond, yes. Impossible, not yet. Yeah, well, I found I hadn't tried Impossible because I wouldn't, you know, get it at a restaurant because um, I don't know what it's like cooked in. Um, but we, they had they now sell at Trader Joe's. They sell uh, like packaged like you know hamburger meat, Impossible, and 
um, you know, it was good. It was like, <laughs> I would, you know, you write in your book that you're, you were never one of those people who was like into the meat analogs. Like I was into meat. Like for, for me to, to eliminate that from my diet was and is still like, it's a sacrifice. I mean, you know, the, the, ups, the upsides are huge, but it's, it's, I, I'm not kidding myself that I didn't really love that stuff. That's interesting because I really, really didn't like meat and I, I gave it up so long ago that I barely remember what it tastes like. But I mean, this book is really for people like you. I mean, you have the discipline, you know, not to actually have meat, but for other people, it's like, it's a craving and it's not only a craving in the moment, but I think it's also craving for the nostalgia and the symbolism behind the dishes mm -hmm. that they have and not wanting to give that up. And now, you know, really you don't have to, it's amazing how many analogs, even for seafood there are that are, you know, I don't know how, again, it's been so long for me, but I, I know people really do enjoy these products and they like them and they're helping. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a contrarian by nature. So like, this is not something I'm proud of, but whenever I hear something, there's a part of my brain that wants to give a speech about what's wrong with it, Yeah, <laughs> which it's, it's easy to do in this world because, you know, Absolutely. it's not, it's a complicated world and no, none of us can be pure. Um, well, let me, let me, before we get to the, the meat-based analogs themselves, you, you raise an objection to your book in your book, right? And you, and you say, why would, why would we need this book when there's, you know, the joy of cooking and like every cookbook in the world is about how to cook meat. Why don't you just buy one of those and cook the meat analogs? So I, I you know, I was thinking that, and then you raised it. So why don't you answer it now for everyone? Well, what page is that? I don't even remember that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't, you didn't write the front matter last? No, I, I definitely wrote the front matter. <laughs> I, uh, I write so much that I, is it in the part where why it's do it's vegans a, and such curious want to replicate foods they gave up? It's the second page. It's a page 10 or page X, as we say in the Coliseum, of the introduction. So it says, it's a, like the second oh, okay, page yeah. of text. Why not open the joy of cooking and swap plant protein for animal meats? Right, right. Okay. I, I remember this now. <laughs> it's written so long ago. Well, you know, if you write at all, you know, sometimes you write something and it doesn't really come into print until a year and a half, two years later. And by then you've written another book or two and many articles, everything in between. But yeah, I, I think I kind of addressed that a little bit before that I really wanted this to be a bridge between the kind of standard American cooking or what we call the standard American diet and the whole foods plant-based diet. So that's why I'm saying I use plenty of vegetables, whole grains, beans, so that it doesn't become just a straight swap and you're not just making a dish that used to be, you know, that uh, triumvirate of the protein, the starch and the one vegetable. This is really much more of a hybrid and incorporates a lot of ethnic cuisines and things that people have grown to love, you know, when they're going out, for example, and then they can recreate it at home. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of uh, the joy of cooking meets the greens meets vegan. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So when you started to so not being much of an analog meat person, um, when you started on this, how did you even know like what to get or how it would work or like you, you see, like you, you don't seem like the most likely person to, to dive into this project. Well, exactly. And I, I think I, I mentioned that in the book too, that I even surprised myself, but it was that, you know, that impetus of saying, you know, I want to do something that really works and that really helps people to make the transition. So I researched like any other book or subject that you're fascinated by, but you don't know a huge amount about. So you start researching. I looked at menus. I looked at old cookbooks. I really familiarized myself with what are the really popular dishes that people like that are meaty. And I really went from there. And that was really the fun part, the research part, and then the trial and error. Not too much error, I'm happy to say. Uh -huh. Did you, so for me, a lot of the meat, like, the meat-based analogs are very unpredictable in how I'm going to be able to handle them. Like, you know, I, I know if I, if I eat a vegetable, like it's fine. My body knows what to do with it. But whether it's like, you know, like the old style, like, you know, not dogs 
or you know Boca burgers or like the evolution like they're all made differently some of them um you know basically sort of beans and rice held together with oats and, and binder some of them are like more high tech than my computer yes and and i also address that by in every almost every single recipe there's a choice of protein someone can use the packaged meat analogs or they can use what are now the traditional vegan proteins tofu tempeh and seitan or you can make your very own meat analogs. And now that's not a big part of the book, but I do have a DIY chapter where you can make your own seitan, you can make your own crumbles out of you know, tempeh and mushrooms. So it, it gives a choice. It's a real spectrum. The point is for people who say, oh, you know what? I really want to eat more plant-based, but I don't want to give up X, Y, and Z. Now there's many, many ways to give up X, Y, and Z, but still have you know, still be able to recreate those flavors and textures. Mm -hmm. Do you hear from, from readers about how they're incorporating the recipes in the book into their lives? Um, well, the book is relatively new, but I, I know that there are, you know, most of the people I know and who I talk about cooking with are other vegans and they're, they're using it. They don't have any objections to it. So, so far, nobody has yelled at me. So far nobody has said hey how could you write a book like this i think that you no know, because <clears throat> oh i know a few people have said oh my dad really likes this this is i guess this must be a real dad book <laughs> is that, it seems like the dads are the real holdouts as, <laughs> as far as me so yeah I've, I've, that's been really gratifying to hear that it's been very pleasing to dads because <clears throat> one of the things i was imagining was that a lot of people are using this book in nefarious ways for subterfuge to, to fool family members into thinking that they're still eating meat. I was wondering if- I haven't heard about that from the book, but I do know there's somebody, uh, a, a version of the plant-based meatloaf is on my website. It's a very popular recipe. And one woman commented that she just made it for her husband with Beyond. She didn't say a word, he ate it, assumed it was meat and she just let it go. She didn't tell him afterwards. Uh -huh. She was using subterfuge. She said she's just going to do it again. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and I'm looking, you know, like one of the, the, the interesting things about these meats is you don't need very much psychologically to feel like you're eating a totally different dish. Right. Like we would we oh, would make absolutely. we would make some um, like a, like a split pea soup. The perfect vegan split pea soup like you'd have had in the 60s at some, you know, hippie cookbook. <laughs> And then we just slice up a little sausage. Like it was like a, you know, a tofurkey sausage. And like everybody literally had like three coins of it. And oh. it totally changed something. It wasn't, you know, so much the flavor, but it was something was different because of that. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, absolutely. Or it went out when you were talking about that, I also thought about putting a little plant-based bacon on a split pea soup. It's, you know, I guess to be maybe a little obvious about it, it's that umami and it gives it a, just just that little something extra. And also, as you were speaking, I was also thinking about the fact that, let's say, in Asian dishes or other cuisines, maybe Indian dishes, you know, the meat is a very small part of it. So mm. much of it is about the vegetables and the sauce and the presentation. And so that's why I think there's so, just so many kind of ethnic recipes in here, you know, global, I should say because it's so easy to swap in something and you don't change the absolute essence of the recipe. It's not like, you know, taking a big slab of steak and putting on a plate and putting, a, you know, a few peas around it and mashed potatoes. It doesn't change, it doesn't really impact the, the character of the dish as much. Mm, well, I guess in the plant-based meat, uh, meat analogs. Yeah, I guess one of the upsides these days is that the plant-based meats are typically much more expensive than, a supermarket meat. So people are think, rethinking the plate, right? In terms of like, you know, six ounces of like shredded chicken is a meal for four instead of like, you know, a six ounce piece is like a lean, a, a stingy it piece of just meat. part of it, you know, like a, like plant-based chicken becomes part of a noodle dish, you know, like an Asian stir fry that has all kinds of vegetables and mushrooms and broccoli it's not the, the main event of it you know it's interesting because <clears throat> i don't know where i saw this i might have been looking for what is the current price of a pound of the beyond ground 
and you're right, it's not, it's not cheap, but it, that really goes a long way. But it was like locally, it's almost 10 bucks. That's mm -hmm. a lot, $10 for a pound of protein. But on the other hand, I also saw that a package of lean ground beef is was seven or eight dollars a pound. So it's not like it's hugely different. So if somebody is really looking to change their diet, I don't know if they have, you know, and if they have the money that they'd mind spending the, you know, the extra two dollars or so. Well, it's interesting because, you know, when I, when I think about spending money on food, um, my, as I've matured as a human being, as a man, I'm much more, I'm more into quality than quantity. Oh, absolutely. Right. And like that, you know, that, like that wasn't obvious when I was a kid, like, you know, shop, right. Cookies, you know, great. There's like, you know, for $2, you can get 48 of them, but you know, now like $2 for a fancy little dessert. Um, and I think, I think it may, we may be reaching the point where people are starting to think of plant-based proteins as actually higher quality. Well, I hope so. And, you know, the thing is with plant-based protein, even, you know, and you going back to something you, you said before, which some of them are higher tech than, you know, your computer. So in the back of my book, I also have a listing of companies and the kind of proteins they make and what the proteins are based on. So that people are, you know, become comfortable with, you know, and it, it, it does really vary. I think in the front of the book, I talk a little bit about pea protein and how that's not an allergen like soy is for some people and how it takes less water to grow. So all these things become factored into it. The point is that we're all thinking, even those of us of the plant-based persuasion are thinking more about what goes into our food. Some of the things in here, some of the brands may be more of a treat as far as I'm concerned, I don't think I'd want to eat them every day. Some of them have too much salt in them, admittedly. So maybe in those cases, rather than going out and buying a steak style protein, I would make my own seitan for that kind of recipe. But all of those options are in there for people. Hmm. Do you have any um, ethical concerns about any of these companies? Or is it your view like, as long as it's, as long as it's not meat, it's a step in the right direction? Um, you know, to say a blanket statement like that, I would say yes. Um, qualifying that by saying that some of the big meat companies have swallowed up some of the plant-based meat companies. I don't know. I don't remember now. Uh, I think perhaps, and I don't want to misspeak, uh, I think maybe Eves was brought by one of the big meat conglomerates, which is on one hand is very weird but on the other hand, is still a step in the right direction. I mean, these companies aren't doing this because of their feelings for animals or kindness to the earth. They're sensing a market, they're sensing money. And so they are gonna get those products distributed more than maybe a small company could. I think a lot of the companies are very concerned with ethics. I kind of fell in love with uh, a company called No Evil, which I believe is in, you know, uh, in your neck of the woods. Have you heard of No Evil? I think I've seen them on the shelves in a, a local co-op. Oh, so, you know, they are a local company to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, they talk about their social justice work on their website. During the pandemic, they donated a lot of food to people who needed it. So I would say that you know, if I were to stereotype this industry, I would say that people go into it because they care about animals and the earth. And then kind of the larger companies who might swallow them up care about profits. But it kind of all, it's almost like the Bruce Friedrich story. As long as it kind of goes in the right direction, I'm okay with it. Mm, yeah. Yeah, my concern, I think, is some of the very high tech stuff feels like it's not exactly, like, I don't know, like not exactly the right direction in terms of human beings surviving on the planet and that we're going to you know, sort of industrialize the thing and we're going to have giant, you know, fermenting vats with uh, with GMO viruses turning out our food. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't actually know if that's better than, you know. I, I think anything is better than animals and uh, because first of all, it's better for the animal. 
I, I really care about the animals. That's probably you know my number one. But really, the climate crisis is, and and people just don't want to talk about how much animal agriculture contributes to greenhouse gases. Not only the greenhouse gases, but the depletion of soil and you know, in Brazil, the way they're clearing the rainforests, and that I think, you know, has been shown to contribute to those massive, more massive storms in the Caribbean. So I think that, to me, anything is better than animal agriculture. It's just so not sustainable. And in that, I also include dairy. Mm. Fair enough. No, but I understand you. And that's why and I, I, I told you, you see, I didn't shy away from that in the book. And that's why I give all these other options. You know, you want to make this dish that's kind of meaty and robust. Well, you can also do that with a an already established kind of plant protein if you don't are uncomfortable with these packaged proteins. Almost every single recipe gives that kind of option. And then other things that are super meaty, they're really basically tofu and seitan. Like we were talking about the vegan sausage before you know, field roast and tofurkey, they're basically seitan and tofu. Mm -hmm. So these are foods that we're already familiar with. Right. And so like, I feel like, you know, there's that saying, you don't want to know how the sausage gets made. And there's a reason for that saying, but with these, you do, you, you know, they're, they're perfectly fine. They're not at all Franken foods. Right. Have any of the companies reached out to you to collaborate with them? I wish there was more of that, but like I said, I'm going to be giving a talk to the employees of the Good Food Institute in a couple of days. No, actually, that's tomorrow. And um, there have been a couple of collaborations. There's a company that makes plant-based shrimp, which is very amusing, I think. <laughs> and, you know, I've uh, used some companies have sent me products to try out. And my wonderful photographer, Hannah Kaminsky, a lot of the companies, you know, they wanted to, we don't identify what product is in each photo because there was some sort of legal uh, something about that. But she got a lot of product to use in the photos, which was mm -hmm. really nice. I think that the, you know, the photos just, like I'll hold one up. I mean, they just, you can practically eat them off the page. Yeah, beautiful yeah. photos. Just, you know, she did such an just an absolutely incredible job here. I was talking about the plant-based shrimp. Now, uh -huh. you know, me having grown up in a Jewish Eastern European Jewish household, we didn't keep kosher, but we did not do shellfish very much. So I barely know what shrimp should taste like. That's not oh. one of the foods I ate a lot before I became vegan anyway. See, that's I grew up in the very similar home and Every time we went out to eat, it was the you know, the shrimp and the pork because you obviously couldn't have that at home. Oh, right. And I, you know, I mean, Jews have been good. Jews have been doing like meat alternatives and milk alternatives forever. Right? And so have the, for example, in the Buddhist tradition. Yeah. You know, the, the, you go to uh, there's a restaurant not far from here, and they do really unique kind of Chinese Buddhist dishes. And it's just amazing. And they're not so much, oh, look at this, this is going to be like meat, although they do use the meat kind of uh, names in the, in the uh, and that's a, a real tradition too, where completely meatless, but meat kind of dishes on the Chinese menu. So it's really, it is really nothing new. And I always have to laugh when dairy companies want to sue people for using the word milk. I mean, the, the, term nut milk or almond milk that's been around for millennia it that reminds me of that uh, word when uh, i think warner brothers was trying to sue the marx brothers for using the name uh, like a night in casablanca in, in one of their movies <laughs> and uh, and groucho wrote them a letter saying we're going to sue you for using the name brothers <laughs> so great. yeah the me the, I guess, you know, the, the real indictment is the, what the meat companies and the milk company, dairy companies think of the intelligence of their consumers. I know. Yeah, it's true. You have to protect them from such a, you know, devious mistake, you know. I know. You know, I was going to say that when we started, you said, let's, you know, talk about something good here. And, you know, this has been a, I, I don't have to say, this has been a horrible year for almost everybody. 
But honestly, in the last two, three years, I've just seen this, it, it was slow, like a slow progression that kind of an explosion towards plant-based eating, plant-based products, so many new things, so many innovative companies. So that's one good thing that's going on. Can't think of well, anything else, but this is yeah. a good thing. <laughs> well, the economics are just amazing. Like, you know, like you're we talking about Bruce Friedrich trying to like doing the best he could, like throwing painted models and, <laughs> Um, but like when, when something becomes economically intelligent, like we, we can't even fathom how quick, like I saw two photos. I saw a photo of New York city in 1911. And, and again, the same street in 1919 In 1911, there was one automobile and the rest were horses in 1919. It was the reverse. There was one carriage and the rest were cars. And that was like during a world war in less than eight years. And not only during a world war, but another really bad pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, there was that pandemic in 1917, 18 too. No, it's true. Sometimes, you know, you flip a switch almost, you know, maybe things have been building up to it, but, and then people probably couldn't imagine a world without horse, you know, horse and buggies at the time. So, yeah. You know. Yeah, that uh, I mean, it just seems like with with the with the technological innovations, there's no way that it's not going to continue, and it's going to you know, and people are going to you know, people are start eating real meat, right? Like the right. cultured meats, like it's going to be the same stuff. You just know, grown, I, grown without animals. Just uh, maybe two or three weeks ago, but you know, time is loopy right now. There was a big article in the New York Times about how Brazil is embracing plant-based meats. I mean, Brazil of all places is one of the meat capitals of the world. And you know, there's been huge fights there, you know, with the environmental movement about clearing rainforests to do cattle uh, rearing and grazing. And I thought, wow, that is really a positive development. And so they were talking about how people are using these plant-based meats and maybe they're moving towards cultured meats in their traditional dishes. So they're realizing they don't have to give up their traditional dishes. They just make it with a different protein product. But I thought that was amazing. And I remember years ago, somebody said, oh, you know, vegan could never visit Argentina because everything is with meat. And I, I, somebody just told me, well, that has changed too. Hmm. So, and uh, let's say three years ago, I went to Iceland for a month and I thought I didn't have time to research or go into it at all. I left to kind of in a, in a huge hurry because I was also on a deadline. And when I got there, it was like a vegan paradise. I just couldn't believe it. The supermarkets were filled with product, the restaurants, you know, they'd have placards on the outside of restaurants, vegan options inside. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow, this is just, you know, you don't, it, it's, it's just so unexpected. And it's been such a pleasure to see after, you know, many of us have been toiling in this movement for so many years that it really, you know, it's not a trend anymore. It's something that's here to stay. Yeah. yeah. Is there a favorite recipe or two from the book you want to oh, give yes. a shout out to? Let's, let's, right. let's sell yeah, some copies. I was going to say, I, I'm prepared for that because everybody asked me what is my favorite recipe. And my if I had to choose one, it would be... Uh, Pad CU. Oh, I love that. And what page? So I can. Oh, the page along. is, let's see, uh, 91 through 93. And my daughter, who really has no, you know, really up until recently didn't have any kitchen skills, and then suddenly she's here with us. She said she wanted to learn to cook. So she made this last week. And this is, you know, for someone who isn't even that experienced in the kitchen so easy to make and we had gotten pad cu for takeout the week before and not that i haven't made this a few times but at that point we officially decided that this one is better because the one from takeout i mean this is not new york city i'm sure it's better in new york city it was just so dry and uninteresting but as you can see in this one i give so many choices you can use tofu nuggets which is actually, I would say, my, my favorite thing to use here. Uh, plant-based chicken, plant-based shrimp, seitan, or diced baked tofu. All right. You can, uh, you know, if you order it in the restaurant, they'll say, what, you know, what protein do you want? Exactly, exactly. Especially at these kind of restaurants, they'll say, what kind of meat? And when they say meat, they're also including tofu. 
So another chapter that I at first wasn't even sure I'd be able to include, and I was so happy I could, was a salad chapter. Because as I said, I'm a salad vegan. And at first I thought, well, what kind of salad has meat in it? And then I remembered, wait, this is America. A lot of salads have meat in them. Every salad has meat in it. I know, seriously. So then just a fun, really just a, such a fun chapter. Yeah, I was looking at the picture of the Cobb salad and realizing like- I, you know, I just turned to the Cobb salad. It's so beautiful. And and not the Cobb salad and the one just before, which is teriyaki chicken salad. It was just like a rainbow. It's a feast. So you can see, you know, there's a little bit of the plant protein in the middle, but the rest of it, you have nuts, you have, you have fruit, you have vegetables. It's sort of like all the food groups in one. And it really is it's so very, very satisfying. So yeah, I would say I that those are among my favorites. Awesome. So I think, I think it's, there's, there's like a welcoming signal to meat eaters when you put out a platter and it's got something like that on it. It's almost, it's almost like it, it's it's a it it lets them know that they're okay. <laughs> you know that's a really good way to put it. You know it's like because you know I think that when people are trying to change or are open to change, I think that the the initial familiarity is really really helpful. I get this question a lot. I really want to eat more plant based foods. What should I do? What should I start with? And my answer is always start with something you already like. Mm -hmm. What you already like, and just find a way to make it plant-based and a little healthier. For example, if somebody likes pizza, I mean, most people like pizza. So instead of putting, you know, sausage and whatever on it or pepperoni, put and and, and regular cheese. Use plant-based cheese. Lots of veggies. Plant-based. You know, the, we were talking about the sausages. Plant-based pepperoni. Or let's say somebody just really likes spaghetti and meatballs. That's a really easy one. You know, because so many plant-based meatballs out there, a good marinara sauce, a nice big salad, and that's a meal that you're already familiar with, but you've been able to convert so easily. Terrific. So you mentioned you didn't remember everything you wrote in this book because it was a while ago. What are you working on now? You have another one coming out or? Uh, no. Um, well, no, I shouldn't say no. I am actually revising and updating my very first book, Vegetariana. She kind of made me famous in the vegetarian world. Came out in the eighties when I was much younger, and um, yeah, it, I, think a, I think a lot of people that was their first cookbook. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. I sometimes I get email from people saying I grew up on this cookbook. My mom used to use it all the time, and I'm thinking now, decades later, I'm I'm, I'm a better writer, I'm a better cook, but the drawings have been pretty challenging to do. I wanted to do some new ones. It is a vegetarian, was a vegetarian cookbook. I'm keeping the title, but I'm making it vegan because, you know, that's who I am now. There's going to be a lot more women, a lot more women's voices, a lot more radicals in it. Like who? Like Che Guevara. Ah. <laughs> um, he, this is, you know, he wasn't vegetarian or vegan, but he has a really a good quote about sometimes you have to, I, I'm misquoting, sometimes you have to um, like push the apple of revolution off the tree because it's not going to fall by itself. Mm. And interestingly, I, I love Karl Marx. Oh, so, nice. Is that your drawing? Yes. Wow, you um, captured him. When... England was going towards from like an agrarian type of agriculture to an animal agriculture. He recognized what an inefficient system it would prove to be. And so I'm going to be able to quote him in my introduction. Mm. So, and then some people who I didn't know were vegetarians or vegans, like Cesar Chavez, he was vegan. Coretta okay. Scott King was a vegan for the last 10 years of her life. She was influenced by her son, Dexter King, who is very active in the vegan animal movement. Uh, Rosa Parks was vegetarian, Nikola Tesla. So it was fun because I got to do, you know, more, I love to research. So I got to do more research and um, I'm hoping that I can, I'm just gonna quietly bring it out this year. I'm not gonna sell it to a publisher. So I feel like at this point in my life, I just sort of, I don't want to give up the rights to this one again. Uh -huh. I've gone through a few iterations. 
So I should let listeners know that you've been showing pictures, so they should check this oh. out on YouTube. Oh, okay. Go to the Knight Field YouTube yeah. channel, they'll be, able to, they'll be able to glimpse the pictures before they okay. make it. Yeah, and, and showing some of the photos from the book also. So I'm working on that, and I'm working on, yeah, I, have a, I run a really large and rapidly growing website about women's classic literature called literaryladiesguide.com. And I just sent a proposal to my agent for something relating more to women's literature. So I'm working on that as well. I'm not at liberty to say what it is as yet. Hmm. So I got a question for you about that. So yeah. like, mainstream society is not vegetarian or vegan or really thinks about it at all. And as a lover of literature, do you ever like, does it ever stick in your throat to like be reading a lovely book by, with a great message and then people are eating meat or it's like animals are not centered? You know what I mean? Right, right. Um, you know, I, I don't run across that that much. I mean, there are glance, you know, passing glimpses of it. And I, I know that people eat and have eaten meat, but if the last time I really read something that had, you know, really dwelled on it too much. Because so we're talking about the Brontes, like and they, you know, in Charlotte Bronte's book, basically they're eating bread and cake and tea in uh -huh. her books. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I think like sort of contemporary fiction, there is a, there's a trope of the vegetarian as, um, you know, in need of, of um, relaxing. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't run. I guess I have. I'm, I'm reading a different type of book. I read a lot of classics, I, a lot of classical wow. literature by women authors. Like right now I'm reading The Song of the Lark by Willa Cather. That is just amazing. I, I'm really, I, your readers don't know, this, your listeners maybe, I'm, I'm a huge nerd. I call myself a professional nerd. And, and you know what? I don't spend a lot of time in the kitchen, never have because I'm also a visual artist, il illustrator, writer. And so that's why my recipes are easy. They're for, you know, I really try to keep it real. I know that people don't have time to spend all day in the kitchen. They get into the kitchen at six, seven, they want a meal in 30, 45 minutes. And I've always been really mindful of that. Mm -hmm. Right, it's great. Yeah, it's great to have constraints. <laughs> Absolutely. Sometimes people accidentally call me a chef and I think that's an insult to chefs. <laughs> <laughs> that's great any, any, anything else on your mind that we should we should cover well let's see um i you know i think we covered a lot of ground here today um i i, I do want to mention maybe i can mention my two previous titles because i put out three vegan cookbooks within a span of something like 15 months it was a little bit crazy so huh. I feel like most, I'm almost like competing yeah, against that's, myself. That's, here. Yeah, that's a, that's an unnatural gestation period. It really is. I, I mean, it was happenstance, and I don't think it ever has or ever will happen again. But um, in the fall of 2019, I put out Five Ingredient Vegan, which was a kind of a new iteration of a book, I, but not a revised edition of, I did this book called Five ingredient vegetarian gourmet, which was, you know, it really, it had no pictures, it was hard to read, and yet it did so well, speaking to the fact that people really like simple. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, this is not a revised edition, but another, you know, iteration of the very simple five ingredient. So that that was a fun book to do. And then very quietly this fall, which everybody was preoccupied by other things, as we know, a book called Vegan on a Budget. So kind of a general everyday kind of workhorse type of book in the kitchen. And then this came out, this one, um, Plant Powered Protein, came out in a de late December of this past year. And at the same time, you know, I've been working a lot on my two websites and I invite people to visit me at theveganatlas.com. And at my other site, literaryladiesguide.com. It's a ton of content on both for people who love to eat and who love to read. Mm -hmm. So you have any advice for people who are like hustling, like, like just doing a, a bunch of different things? Like for me, there's, I don't have a job, so there's no paycheck. 
So every week, every month, every week, every day, I kind of have to decide where am I putting my energy? You know, there's, there's contractual things to fulfill clients or books and that helps, but like, you've got so much going on and it sounds like there's a lot of freedom. And, you know, at the same time, you're a person who enjoys the challenge of constraint. Like, how do you, how do you navigate that? Well, you know, I was going to say, sometimes, as you know, as a creative person, you can work a lot and not make that much money, or you can work a lot and not make any money. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I think I, I understand what you're talking about. And I had another website, vegkitchen.com, that I sold in 2015. And that was a real anchor. It was, you know, like a monthly income and everything. And I don't know, I got this notion to sell it. So I sold it. And then for a couple of years, I honestly, I felt a drift. And that's why I decided to start the Vegan Atlas. And it takes, I would say, a good two years to, in, in, of working very hard to really see income from a website. But because of, I'm an introvert and I don't want to do coaching or classes or you know cooking classes, that it, it suits me. But I, I, I totally know what you're talking about, but I think it's such a, an individual pursuit in terms of balancing that need for cash flow and doing the things that really speak to your heart. And, you know, somehow I've been able to kind of patch it together for many years, but it's not always easy. Mm. Yeah. And have you, um, have you looked for or found synergies between literary, artistic, and culinary? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that goes right back to Vegetariana, which basically it's a book about quotations and literature. And I think I, what I did was I found the quotes in literature first and then matched the recipes to them. And that's how I, I illustrated it. I also designed it. So that really, and then in my second book, American Harvest, I did the same thing with American Harvest. I also had to do a lot of research. I really love research in libraries. And then my books became a little bit more my, you know, it became more a little bit more two paths with the uh, cookbooks. And after a while, people really preferred co beautiful color photos. Not mm -hmm. that I blame them, but you know, you remember the cookbooks of the 80s, 90s, there's the Moosewood and Anna Thomas's book. They didn't have any pictures at all. Yeah. They were very often just one color. And that's what we were used to. But now we, you know, because probably because of the internet and blogs. We really want to see beautiful pictures in cookbooks. Yeah, and now God help the not God help the cookbook author with the, with the pages don't lay flat. Like, oh, I, right. I can't deal with that. What am I gonna? It's true. Yeah. Put in thing? So, and, and in my work as a, I do lit some limited editions. They're called artist books. There's been some overlap with some of my feelings about animal agriculture. And again, you know, I did a book about Elsie the cow, and how that really intersected with sexism so yeah i find ways to into that's a really good question and very few people have asked me that so i appreciate that you know i i see it all as an umbrella and maybe other people see it as a little bit more separate but to me it's really part of the creative path and just trying to do what you love and realistically trying to make money doing what you love mm. it's not always easy but you know if you're determined and I feel like I'm not just not suited to do anything else. So I better figure it out. <laughs> yeah, la last week's podcast guest was talking about the, the two dances, the survival dance and the sacred dance. Mm. And how, uh, you know, the goal of life is to get to a point where they're the same dance. Oh, that's really good. Did Is that already posted online? Because I'd love to listen to that. Yeah, that was uh, episode, findyourself.com slash 455. It's Bill, Bill Plotkin. Did you say find yourself? Plant yourself. Plant yourself. Okay. I thought you said find yourself. And I said, oh, I didn't know that's what it was called. Okay. Oh, okay. That's a good one. It was probably taken. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, so yeah, go ahead. Um, are you finding yourself or are people asking you to be sort of a, um, a cookbook mentor? Because there's like so many people coming up, like, you know, starting in like 2006 and seven with blogs, like all of a sudden it seemed like, you know, like I knew all the vegan cookbook authors, right? There was you, there was, uh, there was Dina, there was Kathy, you know, like I, like there was a small club of you. And now there's a billion of them. Billions. Billions. Oh, do, billions. do any of them reach out to you or? No, 
They're no, no. I thing. think now also there's a certain group of publishers that reach out to the bloggers because they feel like they'll have a built-in audience. So mm. that's happening. Um, but no, I, I mean, I know some of the same people you know, and but you're right. I mean, it, it's just been an explosion. And, you know, is it always a great thing for me? Probably not. But I mean, it's a good thing overall because it just, the message just is getting out there. Mm so much more than it used to. So even if the blogger or the person who wrote the book doesn't have a huge audience, but there's a printing of four or 5,000, they get it out to their following, you know, everything creates a nice ripple. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So mm -hmm. what are you gonna do uh, when, uh, when the pandemic eases? You got any? I'm plans? already dreaming of going to Iceland even before the pandemic eases because they're allowing in, in uh, vaccinated Americans. <laughs> wow. So I just fell in love with Iceland when I was there three years ago. I love, I, I really hate heat. And even here in the Hudson Valley, it's way too hot for me. And I feel really, really uncomfortable going outside. And it's cold in Iceland in the summer. It's like in the 50s, 60s, if you're lucky. Huh. And so I, that's what I'm really dreaming of doing this summer just living there like a person. I did a, an artist writer's residency when I was there and that was really so fun. I, I thought I was in heaven. They also really love books in Iceland. So I felt like it was just it was something about it just really resonated with me. Yeah. Do I remember right that they, like, they have like an all women government there? Well, for a while it was all women. They even sent some of the male bankers who caused the crisis to prison. The, um, the police there are not allowed to have guns. They have guns in the car and the, and, the, and the gun compartment is locked. And if they need to use a gun, they have to call their headquarters to get the combination. Can you imagine? It's a place where you know women, anybody can really feel safe. And I also love the really super long days in the summer. That is just so uncanny to have the sun out still like at 1130 at night. Wow, well, I like I like everything I've heard except for fifty degrees in summer. Yeah, it wouldn't be good for a lot of people, but for me, it would be. It's great. I love it. I loved it. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I'm loving I'm loving this book. It's it's beautifully illustrated. It's uh, it's got ton tons of very comforting, familiar foods and and lots of um, sort of high, higher level flavor uh, profiles. So I feel I feel like this is, you know, when I, this is when I want to impress somebody. This is definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I aim to please. Uh, well, it's been lovely talking to you. I hope, I hope we connect again before another five, six years goes by. I hope so. Well, maybe I'll be in your neck of the woods at some point. Yeah, we can go visit your archive together. We can visit my archive. We can visit Dillip. <laughs> he really, oh, actually, just before the pandemic hit, I actually was scheduled to come down. And at that point, you know, even this was at the beginning of 2020, I was scheduled to come down there and give a talk to the Triangle Vegetarian Society about five ingredient vegan. And then, you know, everything just shut down. Right. So I'll find myself down there. But, you know, at that point, I didn't remember that that's where you lived. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have, uh, I remember now. Like the big, the biggest vegan Thanksgiving. Oh yes, I I know about that. I usually donate a, one of my books for the raffle. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, one one of these days we will we will meet in person. Oh, hope so. All right. Well, Nava Atlas, author of Plant Powered Protein: 125 Recipes for Using Today's Amazing Meat Alternatives. People can find you at theveganatlas.com and literaryladiesguide.com. Right. That's right. Well, Thank have a great so rest of the day. You too. And I look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Take care. Bye.